January 17th, 1991, 3 a.m. Saudi time. Two squadrons of F-117 Nighthawks launch simultaneous strikes across the city of Baghdad, dropping approximately 60 laser-guided bombs on Iraqi communications buildings, air defense bunkers, ammunition bunkers, Scud missile sites, and the headquarters of the Iraqi Air Force. Within minutes, the foundation of Iraq's complex command and control network has been crippled, and the war in the Persian Gulf has begun. It is a mission Nighthawk pilots have anticipated for months. We got notified and we're on a, uh, a little bit of an emotional roller coaster for a couple of weeks, so we actually went. But we deployed through Langley Air Force Base. Uh, and then from there, we made uh, a one hop, about 15 and a half hours, to a place called Kamis Mashad in Saudi Arabia, southern part, uh, almost uh, just, oh, maybe 100 miles north of Yemen. F 117s from the 37th Tactical Fighter Wing, 42 in all, were sent to a Saudi base far from a rocky missile range. But their great distance from Baghdad would require them to fly 2,000 miles round trip every mission. On the plus side, Gamis Mushat was a state-of-the-art air base. When we were arrived at Saudi Arabia, we weren't sure what type of facilities we'd have. As a matter of fact, at one point, we weren't even sure which base we were going to once we were airborne. But the facilities we were, were put into were absolutely superb. The Saudis were excellent hosts and gave us a, a brand new facility they had built and hadn't even accepted from the contractor. So when we got there, they were still turning on the water, finding beds, and they still had uh, had to break the seals and all the, the pipes and doors for us to get in. So it was a, actually one of the better facilities. It's as good as we had at Tonopah as far as war protection, bunkers, and, uh, but the Saudis, again, were just super. They gave us everything that we requested, plus some. The Saudis called the F-117 Shaba, or Ghost. The pilots, crews, and the generals who sent them into battle could only hope the plane would fit that description. The quick victory in the Gulf has led to the misconception that Iraq was a poorly defended opponent that put up little resistance to its attackers. In fact, Iraq was equipped with an interneted radar system and armed with 16,000 surface-to-air missiles and 7,000 anti-aircraft guns. When the air war started, I sat there in the Tactical Control Center and uh, I was feeling very badly. First of all, we were embarking on the taking of lives and uh, that's tough. I didn't know whether the technology would work. I was told the test data showed stealth worked, but I had no way of knowing it. It had never been tested in such numbers, and that was a worry. Fortunately, it turned out great. But I think uh, the thing that bothers you the most is when you sit there, is you wonder of all the things you may not have done, the, uh, the things the enemy could do to you that you hadn't anticipated. And so as this battle unfolded, we felt great relief. I had the honor of leading the, the first attack on Baghdad. Uh, there were uh, 10 of us that uh, went downtown uh, before the rest of the uh, support package uh, came in. Uh, and I have to tell you that, uh, that uh, Baghdad was the damnedest fireworks show that, I, that I'd ever seen. And the city was, was lit up like it was a, a holiday, just in terms of all the street lights and traffic out there, even though it was still 3 or 4 in the morning. But then you take the city that is all lit up, and you accent it first with, with, with arcs of 23 millimeter that are uh, very high rate of fire weapons and shooting almost uh, horizontally. You could look down and see all that. And then about the level that we were flying, uh, there were red-orange bursts of, of a larger caliber flak going off, and it, it was from one end of the city to the other, just, just completely uh, like a cloud layer sitting over it, only so active. And then uh, to kind of accent that whole fireworks light display, there'd be three ships of, of uh, SAM missiles coming right up through uh, that whole mess uh, and explode overhead. Despite the ground fire, the F-117s performed the mission they were designed for, covert surgical strikes against hardened, high-value, heavily defended targets. Flying at night, F-117s dropped 2,000-pound laser-guided bombs from 25,000 feet 
and hit targets the size of shoeboxes. Apparently, the Iraqi army never saw them coming. But on the first night, flying in radio silence, pilots had no way of knowing just how successful their attacks had been. Uh, I had a long way to go to uh, find the tanker again, and uh, <laughs> found him, and uh, got my wingman on. And uh, we talked on the way back and asked, hey, did you hear from so-and-so, or did you hear uh, you know, this other guy check in? And, and we said no. And, and uh, so I thought we'd lost a couple airplanes the first night. And uh, it was a long trip home, believe me. Coming back here, when I landed, uh, the crew chiefs told me that, that everybody had uh, returned, that all the F-117s had come back. And I didn't believe them, because I, I, just, I just couldn't believe that anybody would have survived through all that AAA. Uh, but sure enough, uh, after he told me about the third time, and then other people nodded their heads and said, yeah, everybody made it back, and went, gosh, that's, uh, that was more of a relief than anything. I went up on the second night. Uh, the first night, I think the guys had a cakewalk because no one knew they were coming until they got there. The second night, they knew that we were coming. When people throw bullets up into the air and you're going through there, it's just a, a function of uh, how fast you're going through and how many bullets are up there, if you're going to get hit or not. We were very fortunate, but we also were uh, a little bit skillful in that, too, that no stealths throughout the entire war going to Baghdad almost every night sustained any hits at all. There's no doubt about it that uh, the stealth technology has revolutionized air operations and warfare in total. Uh, the 117 guys were the ones that flew the tough missions downtown in Baghdad, one of the most heavily defended targets in the world. The fact that they were able to go in there without escort, without defense suppression, meant that we did not have to attack hundreds of targets located in residential areas and kept down overall casualties, overall loss of life, and a lot of collateral damage. Well, I'm not going to tell you that it wasn't exciting going through Baghdad, but it's not an excitement that I want to go back and relive in the near future, or if ever. Uh, I think that most of the guys will tell you that, uh, I think I feel the way they do, is that we're doing our job over there, and the excitement that comes from that is mostly about getting the job done. It's real exciting when you figure out people are trying to kill you, but at the time they're trying to do it, you're too busy doing other things. Uh, we're fully occupied when we're doing a target run, and so you don't have time to sightsee usually. Uh, it's, when it's all of them, you're through with your run, you're on your way out, you have a chance to look back and see what was there, and that's when you kind of go, well, you know, thank you, Lord, for another one. Gamis Mushat. General H. Norman Schwarzkopf, commander of Allied forces in the Gulf, has come to inspect the airplane that has been the key factor in destroying Iraq's defense and communications network. F-117 bombing runs were instrumental in driving Iraq's military leadership into underground bunkers and cutting them off from their troops. Strikes on electrical power plants and oil reserves across the nation rendered much of the Iraqi army's high-tech equipment all but useless. In strike after strike, the F-117 was proving its destructive potential. I think it's fair to say that the Iraqi command and control in its totality was decimated by the F-117. And I'm sure there are those who, who attacked targets that were on the fringe, but the main focus of his command and control were attacked solely by the 117s and they were attacked in many cases in an autonomous mode. One 117, one bomb, and nobody else around. Although it's called the stealth fighter, to date, the F-117 has flown in combat exclusively as a light bomber. The F-117 carries laser-guided bombs, which are actually conventional 2,000-pound bombs fitted with special noses that steer towards targets marked by laser beams. Laser-guided bombs are very accurate, but they are also very expensive. Most of the bombs dropped during the Gulf War were unguided gravity bombs. But for targets in urban areas, the coalition opted for precision weapons. And for true precision, those bombs were dropped by F-117s. The accuracy of the Nighthawks was such that although they flew only 2% of total combat sorties in the Gulf, they covered 40% of all strategic targets. 
F-117s dropped over 2,000 tons of bombs and flew more than 6,900 combat hours. The Air Force is fond of pointing out that a target that would have taken more than 500 missions to destroy in World War II can now be vaporized in one mission with one bomb. And since stealth planes can fly into enemy territory without fighter escorts, jamming planes, or other support aircraft, fewer pilots' lives are on the line. Well, it saves lives, but the analogies, the numbers sometimes will lie to you. You'll see it, uh, figures thrown around that we're equivalent of 200 to 300 B-17s. Well, that's true in one perspective, because we can go places they can't go and knock out with one bomb what will take them thousands of bombs to hit. Because, it's, again, it's back to the shotgun effect versus being able to walk up to the same guy. If you're trying to kill somebody with a shotgun and you pelt him with 200 yards, you're only going to make him mad. If you can sneak up and he doesn't see you, you can hit him between the eyes with a ball peen hammer. It's a lot more cost effective. But even precision weapons can result in the loss of innocent lives. In one well-publicized incident, an F-117 dropped laser-guided bombs on a target identified as an Iraqi communication center. The bombs hit their target and the bunker was destroyed. Unfortunately, what served as a communication center by day doubled as a civilian air raid shelter by night. The bombs went exactly where they were aimed, but the target itself, apparently chosen from analysis of daylight satellite intelligence, was hit at the wrong time. Still, even Iraq concedes its civilian casualties were relatively light. In World War II, whole cities were targeted for destruction. Stealth gave the Allies the opportunity to change the emphasis of air war away from genocide and back to strategy. My profession right now is a violent profession, but if you look back at this campaign, uh, Desert Storm, and look at the small number of fatalities and what we were able to do with stealth airplanes and with a lot of very, very smart planning uh, and compare it to what the other contingencies, what could have happened, uh, this airplane did save a lot of lives. It may have saved tens of thousands or maybe even millions of lives by going in and knocking out things that would have taken years to knock out otherwise in a, a classic air campaign. Um, it saved my life, you know, for one, to start with, because I could not have gone where I did and I would have died if I'd been a regular airplane. In late 1991, despite massive defense budget cuts, Congress ordered that production should begin on a dozen new F-117 Nighthawks. During the Gulf War, the F-15E and the F-117 Nighthawk received a great deal of publicity for their performance as deep interdiction bombers. Much was made of their high-tech systems, their ability to drop precision bombs, and their prowess as all-weather night fighters. But 84 much older, less heralded planes flew more than 4,000 sorties in the Gulf, largely at night, in bad weather, carrying heavy loads of laser-guided bombs. These were the F-111F Aardvarks. Designed by General Dynamics, the F-111 entered Air Force service in 1967. It was designed to carry virtually any bomb in the service's inventory, including nuclear weapons. tested in combat during the last years of the Vietnam War. Later, it was kept at NATO bases, ready to fly in the event of a Soviet attack on Europe. In 1986, 
F-111s mounted a precision strike against Libya.